So, welcome back to Inimitable. Uh, we've got a very special bonus episode today featuring Georgina Hogarth, the sister-in-law of Charles Dickens. She lived with the Charles Dickens for nearly 30 years, moving in in 1842 at the age of 15, and she remained with him until his death in 1870. She was a beloved auntie to the Dickens' children. She was a fiercely loyal companion to Charles Dickens himself, who described her as his best and truest friend. But she was perhaps a more questionable sister, and in 1858, when the Dickens marriage fell apart, Georgina decisively, apparently, sided with Dickens. Here to tell us more about it is Christine Skelton, author of the new book, Charles Dickens and Georgina Hogarth, A Curious and Enduring Relationship. Christine, thank you so much for joining us. You're it welcome. It is wonderful to have you here on the show. Um, I'm genuinely fascinated by Georgina Hogarth, and I have to say I was enthralled to your book. Uh, so I do recommend straight away to all of our readers to go and buy your book and read it for themselves. But let's just start off, who is Georgina um, and what drew you to write about her? There are three reasons I wanted to write about her. I mean, most people will come across Georgina for the first time and the main time in any discussion on Dickens's separation from Catherine. What was her role, if any, in the separation? Bigger question is, did they have an affair? We will talk about that perhaps a little <laughs> later. Uh, the other time she comes up in Dickens's history is in relation to Dickens's life at Gad's Hill after he separated from Catherine, when she is talked about as being his housekeeper. And the third occasion when we're likely to come across her is in terms of her role as Dickens, one of Dickens's executors of his will. I was driven to research her for three reasons. One, because in most of the biographies, she's always been pretty much of a shadowy figure. It's never quite clear whether she was with the Dickenses because she could help out. She could help with the children. Was she a nursemaid? Later on, as I said, a housekeeper for Dickens. I was also drawn to research her because of the contradictory nature of how she's depicted in many of the biographies, particularly in those written around about the 1950s. And again, Authors writing around the time of the separation had very different views about her. Some people described her as a wicked, malevolent woman who was plotting against Catherine all the time, hoping to oust her so that she could take Catherine's place at Dickens's side. Others writing at exactly the same time said she was the opposite. She was a weak, insipid woman who only did what Dickens told her to do. More recently, biographers have agreed that she was a pretty decent, probably a pre pretty decent woman who made several mistakes. But the main impetus for researching her was because she was undoubtedly one of the most important women in his life. As you said, they lived together for 28 years and he told us over and over again how important she was to him. He said she was his best and truest friend. At another time, he wrote that she had a higher claim on his affections than anybody else in the world. During the will, during writing his will, he made her guardian of his youngest child, even though Catherine was still alive. And I think very significantly, he left her all his personal papers. And of course, he was quite a, a secretive person. And who was he going to trust? to make sure that these paper, papers were handled sensitively, and he chose Georgina. Added to which, Dickens's comments give us a very, very different picture of Georgina. We're used to seeing her in photographs as an old woman, but she was once a young, vivacious, attractive girl. Dickens said, not that she was bland at all, quite the opposite, that she was the active spirit of the house and that she was very bright, that she was intellectually one of the most able people he'd ever met. So let's go back then to those early years, when she's a young woman. Um, what do we know about Georgina Hogarth in terms of her family? Where does she come from socially? Um, let's go back just before she meets Charles Dickens. Okay, well, Georgina and Catherine's parents were certainly socially a cut above Dickens's parents. George Hogarth, her father, was a solicitor who had his own practice in Edinburgh. He was a, a very cultured man. He could play the cello, he composed music, and he wrote various music articles which were published in papers. He was also a good friend of Walter Scott, which 
impressed Dickens no end because Walter Scott was a huge hero of <laughs> Dickens's. But in common with John Dickens, George Hogarth had debt problems and he was imprisoned on a couple of occasions for being in debt. And it was likely that it was an attempt to escape from his creditors in Edinburgh that he moved his wife and his family of nine children to England and he sought an alternative career in journalism. He managed to get an alternative career in journalism. In fact, it was on the paper, The Morning Chronicle, where he first came across Charles Dickens and invited him home. He wasn't an overly successful journalist, but he managed to make things mm -hmm. tick over. Georgina was one of the youngest of the Hogarth children. Catherine was the eldest, and there was a 12-year age gap between Catherine and Georgina, so she was much younger. When Catherine married, Georgina was about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. But of course, with Catherine leaving, then the next eldest sister, Mary, dying, Georgina was the eldest daughter in the family. And because of the cash-strapped nature of the Hogarths, they were always looking for cheaper accommodation. And although it was still a large family, they couldn't afford several servants. They had to make do with a maid of all work. So it was most likely that Georgina was having to step in and help with the domestic work. And in fact, it might well have been this period that made Dickens later say about her that she should praise her for her domestic skills because she'd obviously picked them up so when she was at home. But of course, when she gets to 15, she's going to have to start to look to her future. And although girls didn't get engaged at 15, it wouldn't be long before she would be expected to look for a husband. And where better to look than in the Dickens's wide and affluent social circle, where she was more likely to come, come across a suitor who had good prospects. Also meant if she moved in with the Dickenses, it would be one less mouth to feed for Mr and Mrs Hogarth, and the family at that point were shrinking. The boys had left home, as well. many of the boys had left home, so there were only the youngest children left. So a maid of all work could cope if Georgina moved out of the Hogarth home and into the Dickens home. And of course, it's interesting because you mentioned that there's quite a big age gap between Georgina and Catherine. She was very young, Georgina now, when Dickens came onto the scene. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important in terms of her later relationship with Charles Dickens, because she probably wouldn't have had many memories without him. No. And in some ways, she probably knew Charles Dickens almost as well as her own sister. <laughs> so she moves in with the Dickenses in, I think, 1842, yes. isn't it? What was life like for her? Is she joining them to be a servant, to help with the kids, or...? Well, again, referring back to some of those biographies that were written in the mid-1950s, it was often said that she was asked to move in to help with the children. The Dickenses had been in America for six months, and during that time, Georgina had gone to help with the children because at that point, Mrs Hogarth wasn't in a particularly good state. So Georgina used to go and visit them, make sure they were okay. So the idea was that, oh, when the Dickenses got back, they asked her to move in with them because she got on so well with them and she was able to help out. I don't think that's quite accurate. They had a nursemaid and four female servants <laughs> to be able to help. Georgina wasn't needed. As I said before, it's more likely because it helped ease the financial pressure on, on the Hogarths. So when she moved in, she was very much an indulged elder daughter. Dickens used to call her his little pet. He always used to buy presents for Catherine and the children whenever he was away from home. And he immediately started including Georgina in that sort of gift recipient role. He also used to ask for her to be invited to any parties, any entertainment that he and Catherine were invited to. So she used to get taken along with that. Catherine's role was slightly different, though, because not only was she the elder sister, and we have to bear in mind the potential for resentment between an elder sister and her teenage younger sister at that point, but she also had to st step in as a substitute mother because Georgina was at that age where she needed to make that transition from Victorian girlhood to Victorian young ladyhood and all the Victorian etiquette rules and regulations mm -hmm. that went with that. And as I've said, Mrs Hogarth really wasn't in a state to, to, to handle all of that. Victorian etiquette was guaranteed to stir up teenage resentment. <laughs> yeah. 
Georgine was expected not to dress as elaborately as her elder married sister. She wasn't expected to wear much jewellery. She wasn't expected to initiate conversations when she went visiting with, with Catherine. Rather, she was wait, had to wait to be invited to join in. And Catherine wasn't above using her younger sister to help out. She would often send her on messages. One of the things she did would, she'd ask Georgina to take the children home after a party. Oh. So, <laughs> after a children's party. So the adults could carry on, but Georgina had to take the children home. The so you can imagine yeah. Georgina not being too happy about that. <laughs> the Dickenses did make mistakes, though. Their own children were young, six and, uh, and under. And by always including her in their invitations to social occasions. It meant that Georgina, at the age of 15, 16, was often invited to to mix with people who had rather rakish reputations, perhaps forgetting that Georgina was young and socially inexperienced, and perhaps her Hogarth parents wouldn't have been too happy if they'd have known the people that she was mixing with. This is nothing in comparison to one major, major mistake that they made when she was still 15. And this was when they got Georgina to pose as a model for their artist friend, Daniel McLeese. Now, Daniel McLeese was a famous artist at this point. He had done photo, uh, paintings of the, of the Dickens family, but this was very different. Young middle-class ladies did not pose as artists' models because artist models were equated with prostitution. Of course. And McLeese could certainly afford a model. So I, I have visions of Dickens saying things, oh, it would be such an honour if you were painted by him. I think he was actually matchmaking, because McLeese was an extremely eligible prospective husband for Georgina, although he was a lot older than Georgina. And I think Dickens was trying to throw them together in the studio. He did lots of um, things to try and get them together. He used to get them to compete with each other (laughs) and who could see the furthest. Um, And he always asked for them to be invited to the same social events. So you could see this was another step. Mm. What he didn't seem to, what Dickens didn't seem to take into account is how Georgina was going to be posed. So being posed was one thing. The second thing was how she was dressed. So she was pictured wearing this very clingy dress at a time when crinolines were not in fashion at that point, but certainly voluminous dresses Mm. were. Young Victorian ladies were told not to reveal their ankles because it would be seen as provocative. And Georgina has nothing on her feet. And as I say, a clingy dress where you could see the outline of her leg. This was this was not going to do her reputation so any good when this painting went on the walls of the Royal Academy. Absolutely. And it's so funny, isn't it? Because you look at the portrait today. I mean, you know, we've got a, a, a copy of it here at the museum, and to the modern eye, it looks so innocent, mm. doesn't it? But of course, as you say, the ankles on show, the arms on show, the leg is on show. So this 1842. Really very, very scandalous. Yeah. And as you say, the fact that she's posing for her, I think in your book you mentioned that, was it Charles Collins referred to... Charlie Collins, yeah, yes. ...refers to models as literally sluts. sluts. So you yes. just think that's the sort of, I guess, reputational damage that George yes. is being yes. exposed to here. Yeah. I mean, obviously, that notwithstanding, you know, she's coming from a family that are quite cash-strapped. She's been having to help out with a lot of the menial work, probably helping to dust and, you know, keep the house clean and get the cooking done. And then she's joining this very mm. glittering circle of celebrities and artists and actors, and she's being invited to these parties. And yes. you think it must have been so exciting yes. for her to join yes. this world. But of course, she stays with them for a very long time. And mm. you mentioned, of course, you know, Dickens is matchmaking with McLeese. That doesn't happen. And mm. actually, as the years go by, Georgina doesn't marry. and She mm. becomes increasingly... I mean, I say older and more mature, probably by, by today's standards, she'd still be very young, but certainly yes. by Victorian times, she was getting older and older mm. and still wasn't married. Does her dynamic in the household start to change? What? She started to change when she reached adulthood. And these are the years that she described as the happiest of her life, these early to mid-twenties. When she was 20, the three of them, the Dickens, Charles and Georgina, were very affable company. For one another they got on really well with Dickens in particular she had a particular rapport and they did become real friends they had a shared sense of humor Georgina was an avid newspaper reader so she could take part in political and social discussions with him 
And perhaps most importantly, she needed to walk as much as Dickens needed to walk. It was a lifelong passion for her as it was for Dickens. So she would often accompany him on his seven to 12 miles a day walks. And she was one of the few people who could keep up with him at four miles <laughs> an hour, per hour. So theirs was a genuine friendship. It was probably, their relationship was probably at its most equitable mm. at this point. With Catherine, again, they would seem to be getting on really well. Georgina would stand in for Catherine as mistress of the house when, George, when Catherine was in the late stages of, of pregnancy and during the early weeks of her confinement. The only real sign that they were growing apart was their friendship groups. Catherine's group of friends tended to be the wives of famous men. And there is evidence from some of the other women who talked about how they used to mock their husbands behind <laughs> their back. And they weren't always as um, idolising of their husbands as Georgina was. She, she adored men of genius and she, was, she, she really had that stars in her eyes thing with her. And she didn't like Catherine's women friends making jokes about their husbands. So Georgina's friendship group tended to be what I always call Dickens-approved women, the ones that <laughs> he liked and that adored him. So she had, they were like a Dickens' own fan club. So there's, you could see that difference between the sisters in their early 20s. And there is a lovely story you mentioned in your book that I think captures the kind of amusing spirit of Catherine and her friends. There was a dinner party, wasn't there? And mm -hmm. Catherine made the mistake of mocking Dickens in public. Yes, Could yes. Could you tell us about that? It was when she said, somebody at the dinner, a lady at the dinner, had asked him how he got his ideas. And he said he had to get up and write them down immediately. And Catherine basically said, tell me about it. When he gets back into bed, he jumps in and his feet are as cold as stone. <laughs> Dickens didn't think this was funny and he stormed out of the room and there was this awful silence that fell over the dinner party and it seemed rather unfair because the men were saying amongst themselves afterwards that she, he, they didn't think she'd been very respectful of him. What do we know in terms of as Charles is growing increasingly unhappy with his wife Catherine, do we know what Georgina is making of this? If, if we go to 1857, 1858 when they were separating both Dickens and Catherine said that Georgina had done her best to try and keep them together. And the Hogarth family also believed that Georgina wasn't taking sides, that she was opting to be neutral between the two of them. But when the crunch came and Catherine was effectively ousted from Tavistock House and set up at, at Gloucester Terrace, Georgina insisted on staying and her parents were horrified because they had assumed that she would be moving out with Catherine and they feared that if she stayed that Georgina would be giving credence to Dickens's lies about Catherine being an unfit mother. She fell out with the Hogarths. I don't think she ever made it up with her mother. And the question is, why? And to get an indication of why she was doing what she was doing, we need to rewind five years and go back to 1853, when Dickens was obviously getting dissatisfied with Catherine. And one of the ways in which he showed his distaste for Catherine's presence is showing that he preferred to spend time with Georgina. One thing he would do, for example, in their holiday homes. Now, the holiday homes that they had in Broadstairs and when they went abroad always needed some rejigging. And Dickens virtually moved in with Georgina sometimes into her bedroom, not sleeping in the same bed with her, of course, but he would have his washing facilities moved in so he could use it as a dressing room or he might have his writing materials used in because he'd find it a quieter place where he could work. He wouldn't think twice about going into her in the middle of the night and waking her up because he wanted a conversation or he wanted her to get up and go for a walk with him. Yeah, that's shocking. I mean, for a man to walk into an unmarried woman's bedroom, Yes, that's, that's quite scandalous. Yes. Similarly, when he went to Italy with um, Augustus Egg and Wilkie Collins, he used to write alternatively to Catherine and to Georgina. If you compare the letters, 
The letters to Georgina are much warmer and imply he can't wait to see her again, with Catherine he's saying, this is just a business letter. And you have to imagine what it must have been like for Catherine and Georgina reading these letters out to the rest of the family of and how different it actually sounded. And as they lived together, I suppose they could be receiving them literally in the same room at the same time. Yes, yes. And, oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. And I think Dickens was being extremely reckless and not realising what he was doing because Georgina was in her 20s. She hadn't got anybody else on her romantic horizons. And here she had this brother-in-law paying her all this attention, nobody else around, and the inevitable happened. And she appears to have fallen in love with Dickens. Certainly her niece, Katie, Dickens's second eldest daughter, and her friend noticed that Auntie Georgie appeared to be in love with Dickens. On the positive side... She was very sensible. She did stir things up a couple of times between Catherine and Dickens deliberately. And she did try flirting with Dickens and he soon put her right about that. (laughs) But ultimately she knew that nothing was going to come of it. She would have realised that her feelings weren't reciprocated. And she certainly didn't want to give up the life she was leading. So she didn't want them to separate. Fast forwarding now, four to five years when things are really starting to fall apart. She was prone to be more sympathetic to Dickens than she was towards Catherine. So when Dickens fell in love with Nellie Turnan, Nellie, who was an 18-year-old actress, same age as Katie Dickens, and he said there was nothing in it. His motivation towards Nellie was purely as a mentor or as a guardian figure because she was, um, she had, she was fatherless, as were her sisters. Georgina believed him. Catherine didn't. Catherine and Mrs Hogarth thought he was having an affair. Georgina was, no, 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 he can't be. After all, she had seen Dickens have infatuations with young women before. These had been exactly the same. He would be absolutely ecstatic about some young woman or another, and it would blow itself out within weeks. And she would have assumed this is an action replay, he'll have a crush on her, it will blow itself out, and everything will go back. To normal, so I think that is one of the one of the, an important reason why she decided to stay. Another reason because Catherine later said, well, she implied that she'd also wanted Georgina to remain at Tavistock House. It would obviously be a conduit to her to see how her children were and what was Dickens' state of mind. Bottom line is, what else was she going to do? She was completely reliant financially on Dickens. If Georgina had gone with Catherine to um, to her house, then she would have put pressure on Catherine's allowance that, jo- that Charles was giving her. So it would have to stretch to two people, not just her. She could hardly go home to her Hogarths. They didn't have any money either. She also had lived with the Dick- in the Dickens' household since childhood and certainly all of her adult years. And she liked it. So there was lots of pressures, really, for her to stay as much as to go. Ultimately, of course, she wanted to stay. But I think it, we, we, at that time coming up, she, she, she had a, a sympathy and an empathy for Dickens. But I, I don't believe she thought there was anything going on between him and Nellie. She just saw a man that was dissatisfied with his wife mm. and wanted out. And I think also, you know, one of the things that really struck me reading your book was the sheer detail that you, you painted in terms of the... The household in the 1850s, you know, shortly before the, the actual separation. I mean, I was really struck by just how tense it seems to have been at times. Mm-hmm. You know, was it the Dickens's publishers who declined to go and visit them in the country because they said Dickens just shouts and swears at his wife and yes. they didn't want to go and stay with him, it's too uncomfortable. Yes. And you think if Dickens is doing that in public, what yes. on earth was he being like in private? Yes. yes. And so there would have been a lot of tension in the household. And I often wonder if, you know, people sometimes suggest Georgina stayed to look after the children and then quite often pro-Catherine people sort of argue, well, no, no, that's nonsense. And I think, well, actually, maybe given how tense things were, maybe there was that desire that she could stay to keep the peace. And mm-hmm, kind of, mm-hmm. you know. well, Katie Dickens <clears throat> said that John Forster and Georgina, I mean, Katie was not a, a huge, huge fan of, of Georgina at this point. She felt that John Forster and, and Georgina pushed her mother out and made decisions for Catherine. John Forster 
and Catherine had been really good friends at one point, and Georgina, of course, once was very sympathetic towards her, and got on well with her sister. And it might have been that to try and keep the peace, they were kind of pushing her to mm. one side. Catherine was pretty battered at this point, mentally. I mean, she'd got Dickens going on at her all the time. Catherine was really worried about her eldest son because he was out, out in India and things weren't looking mm. comfortable there, so she was worrying about him. And as I said, she was she was anxious about how Dickens was treating her. So she had a lot to be quite despondent about at that point. And then, of course, Nellie had come on the scene. So you could understand, perhaps, why John Forster and Georgina were making decisions about the house, to try and keep Dickens calm mm. in order to keep the, the marriage together. One thing that I really felt was you use loads of lovely examples of letters um, in the book at this time. And Dickens very often at the time, and also sometimes in the same letter, is really critical of Catherine and really praising of Georgina to the yes. point where it's almost a deliberate contrast, yes. isn't it? Yes. She's the saint to Catherine the sinner. Yes, yes. You know, what that must have done to them in terms of their psychology, in terms of how they would have then approached Dickens and perhaps their own relationship yes. between Georgina yes. and Catherine as yes. well. People often say, don't they, when Georgina separate or when Catherine and Dickens separate, people often say, why didn't Georgina go and live with Catherine? And you think, well, Clearly, there was a lot of unhappiness between those two. Well, as I said, Catherine and Georgina were still speaking when they when um, Catherine left. They were both working to try and get their younger brother a job. They were working together mm. on that. We only know, actually, in February of 1859, when William Thackeray was saying that he'd visited Catherine, and Catherine was absolutely furious with, with Georgina. And she, obviously, there had been some argument between the, the two sisters at that point. And um, things, they never were on an even keel after that. But they were certainly still speaking at that point. Georgina had developed a, a, a dislike towards Catherine by then because simply on the basis that she felt that Catherine wasn't trying hard enough to be the kind of wife that Dickens deserved. And I think she felt irritated by Catherine. She managed mm. to cover it up for a time, but I think that irritation came up after they'd actually separated and Catherine was aware that her sister was quite irritated mm. with her. Absolutely. And, and what about then at this point? Because there's the letter that you quote in your book that Georgina writes to uh, Maria Winter or Maria Bednall, um, in which she kind of helps perpetuate some of the mistruths that Dickens was spreading yes, about Catherine yes. in particular, her yeah. mental instability and her, her yeah. you know, being a terrible wife and mother. Do you think that is Georgina herself no. You think that's Dickens? No, that's, it's almost word for word what Dickens wrote in one of his own letters to oh. Angela Burdett Coots. So he might have dictated it to her, or she would certainly have been aware of what his sentiments were. So I, she was echoing Dickens, and I think she was prepared to do that because, as I said, she was quite irritated with Catherine mm. herself by because she didn't think Catherine had, had, was mm. being a a good enough wife for Dickens at that point, that she should have tried harder to please him. And I suppose at this point then, just thinking in terms of context, once Catherine has moved out, Georgina becomes very vulnerable, doesn't she? Because she's not living with her sister, she's living with her sister's ex-husband, effectively. Yes. You know, if she displeases Dickens, if she gets on the wrong side of him, as lots of people did, mm. she could be out on a limb. I, I think it was even worse than that, because she had her name was tainted forevermore in mm. many ways. And her reputation was in shreds because, as you said, ultimately she was a single woman living with a married man. And it was it was just highly uh, controversial. And she was certainly more sanguine about being gossiped about mm. than Dickens was. And I think that's quite remarkable, given that Dickens had been the one who dropped her in it in the first mm. place because he was the one who'd written personal statements that he had published in various places. And in one of them, he said he um, resented that the name of an innocent young woman was being banded around. Well, of course, all the newspapers went, who's this innocent young woman then? And ferreted around and came up with two names. They came up with Ellen Turner and Georgina Hogarth. Mm. So are they saying there's no smoke without fire? So is he having an affair with Ellen Turner? Is he having an affair with Georgina Hogarth? Is he having an affair with both? So it was Dickens that actually stirred the pot on this one. But Georgina didn't seem to resent him for that. Right. But the fact was, people were not comfortable 
with the new situation, the new reconfigured Dickens family. Mm. So it was a difficult time. Dickens was very aware of this and did immediately try to put a respectable face on it. And he did this, you could see, in the 1861 census. Now, usual, usually ladies of the house, when their names are entered, they're under the section that says professional occupation. It's left blank. And where Dickens filled it in for his daughter, Mamie, it's left blank. Against Georgina's name, he wrote servant housekeeper. Wow. So he officially registered, registered them as employer and employee. So she, her status had dropped from upstairs to downstairs, which must have been fairly devastating in one sense, but it also cleaned things up. <laughs> yeah, it it was slightly yeah. more respectable. Yeah. And this kind of anomaly, this, this vulnerability in her position, really comes to fruition several years after the separation, doesn't it? Because Georgina suffers from a health problem, a heart problem. There's genuine fears that she might be dying. She doesn't die and actually, you know, outlives Dickens by almost 50 years. She lives yep. on to the ripe old age of 90, dying in 1917. What do you think was happening when she has this health scare in the 1860s? Okay. So she was 35 years old when she was diagnosed with a potentially fatal heart condition. We know exactly what happened thanks to a member of a midweek party that they were, they were holding at Gads Hill. And he kept a detailed memo of what they did over those few days. And he talked quite extensively about Georgina, how she was always uh, chatted away at dinner, that they enjoyed long walks, they went on various escapades, they uh, played whist in the evening, they did mimes, they did all kinds of games. She was absolutely on top form. When they left on the Thursday morning, everything was fine. And it was just Georgina and Dickens. That next morning, the Friday morning, so they'd left on the Thursday lunchtime, Friday morning, Dickens is writing to a friend saying, Georgina is seriously ill. I'm very worried about her. And seven days later, he actually took her on holiday. Now, she'd seen some specialists and she'd had this heart condition diagnosed. It seems very odd that Dickens took her to Dover to start with, but they didn't stay in Dover for a seaside break. He took her across to Paris, which was in the middle of a building site at the, that time. They were doing lots of work internally at Paris, and he took her then outside into the French countryside. The question is, why was he rushing this terribly sick young woman around? Now, if we read the circumstantial evidence about the relationship between Dickens and Nellie Turner, as it may be, this was around the time when Nellie became pregnant. And we certainly know that just after this period, Dickens moved Nellie and Mrs. Turner over to France. So was it that Georgina was over in France with Dickens, looking for accommodation for Nellie and Mrs. Turner, Dickens could hardly go around trying to make lying in arrangements and asking about midwives and doctors without somebody recognizing <laughs> him. And it would be very odd for a man to be doing that. But Georgina was a fluent French speaker. Dickens used to send her abroad to go and lease holiday homes for the family. She was the perfect person to ask. But of course, to get her to do that, he, he was going to have to tell her about his relationship with Nellie. You imagine the devastation that must have had on Georgina because she genuinely believed nothing was going on, not least the age gap, given mm. that Ellen was the same age as Katie. Nothing. She knew Ellen as well. They were quite good friends by this point. So she, I don't believe she had any idea at all. And of course, once Dickens told her, she would have realised, A, that he duped her. Also, what was going to happen to her? She had been named alongside Ellen as one of the women that Dickens might potentially have been having an affair mm -hmm. with. They protested both of them were innocent. If Nellie was found to be pregnant, could there be any truth in the rumours about Georgina as well? And then what would happen if Dickens decided he was going to divorce Catherine and he was going to marry Nellie instead? What was going to happen to her place? You can imagine that terrible 
fear that she must have had. And in fact, modern medicine now tells us something about her symptoms that they didn't have access to at the time. So she was dizzy, she had nausea, she had chest pains and palpitations, and of course, they are symptoms of a heart attack. They are also symptoms of panic attacks. And she had several more of these over the next few months. Notably, the last one was coincided with Dickens taking Nellie and Mrs. Turner to France. It seems, there's no doubt, she had a complete mental and physical breakdown at that point. And Dickens was so worried about her. And it really brought him up sharp because he had been negligent about his whole family after he finished with, after he and Catherine had separated. Katie Dickens had said he was like a madman. Mm. Certainly Georgina didn't get the little trips out that she used to get. She'd been relegated to downstairs. He's, he wasn't as attentive to Georgina as he had been. But worries about her illness really changed it. And he did become a lot more aware of her. He fussed over her health. And he, um, he did arrange little treats, he even flirted with her sometimes. So it, they tended to get back more of an equitable relationship mm. after she'd been ill. She never fully recovered, though. She, some of the vis- our visitor to Gads Hill commented that she was very quiet, and that wasn't like Georgina. She, she wasn't the vivacious, lively young damsel that they used to talk about in her, in her youth. But she started to repeat... Dickens' opinions on anything and everything, using his words. Mm. It was as if she had morphed into him. She didn't like to go away when he, when he wasn't around. He, she, when he, he was in America on his second reading tour, um, people would invite her out and she said, no, 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 I don't, I don't, like, to, I don't like to go. She, she liked to be around the sense of Dickens. And as I said, she didn't recover from that, even after for some years until after he died. She's gambled everything on Dickens. Mm-hmm. She's gambled her reputation. You know, I mean, at the time, yeah, again, you mentioned in your book, there was a newspaper report suggesting she'd had three illegitimate children. Oh, yes, by yes. You know, and she had probably had a virginity test as well to prove which it. Which is yeah. horrific, isn't it, to yeah. think of a male doctor yeah. coming and yeah. stripping her down yeah. and, and doing that. I mean, this is... And she'd fallen out with her own family in the same yeah. process. So she's gone through this really kind of almost tortuous period of time mm, mm, to mm. then find out, as you say, that she's been duped, that mm, he's lied, mm, that he mm. is having an affair, mm. and that she's very, very vulnerable now. Yes. You know, she's yep. at the whims of Dickens and, and whatever his future relationships may and be. And of course, this continued after he died in 1908. A man calling himself Hector Charles Bulwer Lytton Dickens came forward and tried to get some money from a charity. This was 1908. And the charity wrote to Henry Dickens asking him to... to authenticate that this is one of his half-brothers because the story that this man was telling was that he was the illegitimate son of Georgina and Charles and had a whole story that vaguely coincided with the dates. He said he was born in 1854 and that he'd been moved to, um, and that Georgina had moved him to Gads Hill and Catherine had left because of that he'd moved Georgina in and he wanted to marry Georgina, but he didn't. But he'd got this whole life story, which Georgina would have been further traumatised mm. about. And unfortunately, Henry Charles Bulwer Lytton Dickens was very convincing in his own family because this has gone on, on, I think it was 2011 or 2012, when Mark Dickens and his cousin took a DNA test to prove that they were not related to this particular branch of the family that descended from Hector Charles Bulwer wow. Lytton Dickens. And of course that wouldn't have been an option when no. he's claiming it is a story. So for no. the rest of Georgina's life, she's carrying this she's carrying stigma, the, this yeah. shame, and this, yeah. this feeling that at any moment her reputation yeah. could be yeah. destroyed. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a moment. Dickens dies in 1870. Georgina then plays a really key role in his legacy, in shaping yes. his legacy, doesn't she? Can yes. you tell us a bit about her, her yes. role here? Um, she, it took her some time to actually get into the groove of being an executor. Just after Dickens died, she was in deep mourning. She was in the kind of mourning that Queen Victoria experienced over Albert, and it stretched over a period of time. She kept saying, life isn't worth living. And it was only after the death of Frederick Ouvery and then John Forster, or sorry, John Forster first and then Frederick Ouvery, who was his solicitor, that she was the only person left 
who was named in the will as somebody who would look after his, his literary personal legacy. And she then started to really exercise her rights. Up until that point, though, she had things that started to go wrong for her. Things started to go wrong for her immediately because she was so deeply bereaved. And despite the fact that Dickens had left her a vast sum of money, around about a million pounds in today's money, she had money worries because... Of course, Gads Hill was part of Dickens' estate, so everything got sold. Mm. So not only did she lose Dickens, she lost her home and she lost every item of furniture mm. in it, as did Mamie. So they had to lease the house and furnish it. Mamie wanted it to be exactly as she'd come from. So there was... So, and Georgina said, I just want to make her happy. Mm. I just She can have whatever she wants. So within the first year, she was biting into the capital of the money that yeah. Dickens left her and it took her some time before she realised this money was going to go too quickly. And you, you do make a really good point in the book where because everything was sold in Gadsdale they're literally buying back the plates they that the they've plates. been eating on. Yes, yes. So you can imagine that, that the trauma of that on top of, of losing somebody that, you're, uh, that you've been so fond of and the fact that she'd already had a, an emotional, physical and emotional breakdown. So it did take her some time and it was only when she started to get into the groove again and in fact the editing of the, the letters was may have been one reason that got her to start to um, take responsibility for her role as, as as executor. And she did say one of the reasons she did it was to, if somebody's going to make money out of it, it may as well be me, and me <laughs> as well as everybody. Although what Dickens would have thought of it, who knows? Yeah. Because he really didn't want anybody to reproduce his letters. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And, could, and do we get any indication... Because I'm just really conscious that, you know, throughout so much of those those last years, there was a lot of difficulties and strains, as you've said. What about her relationship with Catherine? Dickens dies in 1870, Catherine doesn't die until 1879. Is there a reconciliation between the two women? Yes and no. Katie thought she'd got them together in 1875, but I don't think Catherine and Georgina were aware that they were supposed to be back together because <laughs> Georgina used to say things like, oh, we went to have dinner with her, it doesn't give us any of us any pleasure. So there was still um, a distance. Mm. Georgina, though, did have a habit of coming up trumps in the end. When, when Catherine was ill and she was suffering from terminal cervical cancer, she did go and nurse her, and she talked a lot about her poor sister at that point. And obviously Catherine liked the fact her sister was caring for her. But as soon as Catherine died, she was back to saying nasty things about her and saying that she was never the kind of wife that Dickens deserved. And, and if people know what she was truly like, then people would have been more sympathetic towards him at the time. So I would have said, no, she, the, the, there wasn't an awful love lost on Georgina's part. Um, as I said, I always think Catherine was more tolerant, but I mm. think Catherine had, had had reached her limits as well by that point, but she would have been mm. grateful to her. I do like the fact that you point out that in, in her bequest, Catherine leaves Regina a photo of her son. Yes, you know, Walter. a little, little yes. sort of message yes. there, isn't it? It was, the one son, it was the one son, she left the photograph of the one son who never had Georgina looking after him after the relationship split. All the other children were still around after the after Dickens and Catherine had separated, but Walter was already away by that point, and the only person she left a photograph of to Georgina was of Walter. So I think she's making it <laughs> wonderful. Well, this has been a wonderful insight into Georgina Hogarth, and of course, there is more to find out. We have recently acquired these hundred and twenty letters, yes. of, and you knew about them yes, in your yes, research, yes. Right, didn't you? Um, they'd come up in for sale in nineteen ninety nine, and somebody had written an article for the. Dickens, uh, Dickensian magazine, saying he had read them and that they were a fund of information about the Dickens family and it also sort of tracked that period of time uh, uh, and the relationship between Georgina and one of then Dickens's close friends, Charles Kent. Um, but unfortunately, the letters seem to have disappeared and it's only now that they've come to light again. Yeah, they are back in our collection. They are remarkably good quality. Um, and what's interesting is that, of course, they are unpublished. They, yes. they, there are no transcripts of them. No. One of our projects, now that we've got them, is to start making transcriptions so that we actually know what the contents of these mm -hmm. letters mm -hmm. are. Um, as kind of one of the most eminent Georgina scholars, uh, what do you hope might be? I would anticipate that Georgina, she liked to reminisce. 
So I anticipate that she would talk quite a bit about his domestic life and he, and they had many entertainment uh, entertaining weekends and where they would talk about everybody and everything. So she may give some insight into Dickens's views on world events, onto the latest political and social um, uh, shenanigans. She might also be able to give some indication of what Dickens's opinions were about his own children. He mm. used to hold back on that. It would be also interesting to find out if she said anything about how Dickens's writing routines had changed, because once they were at Gad's Hill, he'd obviously developed another source of income which took him away from home. So there was the reading tours as well as the work at um, on all the year round at the offices and then having to fit his writing in at, at, at home as well. So I'd hope we might learn a little bit about that as well. Yeah, and hopefully hopefully we can do a follow-up episode and can confirm it all. Yes. Uh, Christine, it has been an absolute wonder to talk to you. I mean, you. obviously, this has all been incredibly interesting. We have barely scratched the surface when it comes yes. to Georgina, so I would recommend to all of our readers to go and buy your book. There is so much detail in there that really brings the whole dynamics of the Dickens family and their age to life. So but thank you for at least giving us a glimpse into your incredible research. And thank you, Jordan. <laughs>